everyone. Uh, good afternoon to everyone who is joining us uh, from everywhere in the country. My name is Dr. Stembi Lembete from the University of Pretoria. And I would like to welcome you all to our third conversation about mental health during COVID-19, uh, the series of conversations that, that's been organized by the Mutipe Foundation Center for Gender Equality and Leadership. Today, we are really excited to have an excellent panel to speak about mental health and COVID-19 and how institutions and organizations are responding to it. On Sunday night, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced that much of the country would be moving to level three uh, of the lockdown using the risk adjustment strategy. And what that will mean is that about 8 million people are going to go back to work uh, from the 1st of June. Uh, and so many more workplaces are going to be open. We also know that the Department of Basic Education is preparing for learners uh, to start their phased re-entry into school. And so I think that this is a perfect moment then for us to, having, to be having a discussion from the perspective of institutional leaders um, and, and managers about how they are going to be responding to uh, the mental health needs of the people in their respective institutions. And this follows the discussions that we had about the cultural and the social aspects of mental health and of course what the impact of um, COVID-19 had been on the mental health of healthcare workers uh, that are going to be assisting and helping in this crisis. So I I am so excited that we've got a great panel joining us today of experts uh, and institutional leaders uh, in different capacities. And I would like to uh, introduce them uh, one by one in order of, um, in alphabetical order, because uh, this is really a panel of incredible equals. So starting with uh, Professor Tawana Kupe, who is uh, also my boss at the University of Pretoria. Uh, he is a Zimbabwean South African academic. He's the vice chancellor of the University of Pretoria. Uh, he joined us at UP uh, from this university where he was the vice principal um, and chairperson for the Africa Australia Africa Universities Network. Uh, he served as the executive dean of the Witz Faculty of Humanities for six years. Um, from 2007 to 2012, uh, after serving as the head of the Witt School of Literature and Language Studies. Uh, he has a BA degree uh, and master's in English from the University of Zimbabwe and a DPhil in Media Studies from the University of Oslo in Norway. And he will be one of the people who will be speaking us today, to us today about university responses uh, to COVID-19 and the mental health uh, aspects of that. Um, uh, the next person I would like to introduce, because she's going to have to leave us quite soon, is uh, Professor Mamukheti Pakeng, who is the Vice Chancellor of the, the University of Cape Town, which she joined in 2018. She's a Professor of Mathematics Education. Uh, before joining the U UCT, which is my alma mater, she was the Vice Principal of Research and Innovation at the University of South Africa uh, and Acting Executive Dean of the College of Science, Engineering and Technology technology at UNISA. Uh, she has a BSc in Pure Maths from the University of the Northwest and an MSc in Maths Education from WITS. Uh, in 2002, she became the first black female to female South African to obtain a PhD in mathematics uh, education. She has many awards for excellence in service, uh, including honorary doctorates, um, and an NSTF award for the most outstanding senior black female researcher over the last five or 10 years. Um, the next person we have on our, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Prof. Pakeng. The next person we have on our panel is Ms. Musi, Musi Mashiane, who is the Group Executive Human Resources for African Rainbow Minerals, uh, a position that she's held since 20, July 2014. Uh, she has a labor relations certificate, a B administration degree in industrial psychology, an honors degree in industrial psychology, and a master's degree in business leadership with change management in, with a change management elective. Uh, 
Uh, she completed her research thesis on the topic Transformational Barriers Against Women Advancement in South African Platinum Mines. She's currently enrolled for her doctoral studies, investigating the lack of transformation in the South African mining industry in integrating black professionals into executive positions. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Ms. Mashiane. Uh, it's such a great honor to have you on the panel. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Wea my mother is a Zwane, that's her maiden surname. So she always says that even at school, uh, they were the last ones to be called on the class list uh, in the register. Uh, Zwane is an inspirational speaker, network builder, student educator, and leadership development facilitator. He's been engaged in human resources management, business, and leadership development for t over 25 years with local and international companies. Uh, he was co-owner for over seven years and served as executive chairperson at Franklin Covey, South Africa for five years, Breakthrough Development Limited, a leadership development and business consultancy company founded in 2000. He served as human resources executive and director, as well as CEO in the oil and industry, financial services, business consulting, gaming, gaming and public sector uh, industries. Um, he's also a part-time lecturer at Gibbs uh, at the University of Pretoria's uh, Business School. Thank you so much for being with us to this illustrious panel for being with us. Without further ado, I'd like to start because Prof Peking is going to be leaving us um, quite soon because she's got a whole recruitment process happening for her uh, at her university that was speaking about leadership. I'd like to start with you, Prof Peking, to ask you, um, you know, COVID-19 and the associated lockdowns and trying to deal with it have really uh, provided an unprecedented challenge to institutions of all kinds, but particularly to higher learning institutions. Uh, so all of our universities were forced to sort of lock down and to shut down. Students were sent home and all teaching and learning has been moved online. Um, but, and I know that at UCT, you've been offering all sorts of other services like counseling services uh, online even before COVID-19. It's what kind of challenges are you finding that your students are facing now that they're studying from home? Um, and, you know, how, which students are most vulnerable and how have you been able to assist those students with technology during this time? Thank you very much, Tembile, for, for the introduction. Um, perhaps I should start by saying COVID-19 has thrown a lot of challenges at us, but it has also thrown a lot of opportunities because I believe that with every crisis, there's an opportunity. And so we're thinking about things that we never thought about right now as a result of this uh, a crisis, which is good. And we're doing things that we never thought we could do so quickly and we're doing them now. And so that's a wonderful opportunity. In terms of students' uh, uh, students' challenges, I mean, just implementing emergency remote learning brought with, its, with it a lot of challenges for students. We know that technology, hardware, data was important, but it, it was clear from the beginning that it will not be sufficient to solve the problem. It was key that we have that in place, but it would not be as sufficient. And so we've had to deal with the challenges of thinking about where, how we support students who are further on, because the challenges uh, that they face are not about technology. They're about having a conducive environment for learning, but they're also about not being in a place, even if the, uh, the family might sacrifice and give space for a student, some students are living in such remote areas that network is very weak. So even the data that we gave them hasn't been so useful. And so we've had to be creative. And that's why in addition to the technology and the data, we, we, ha we, we have started two weeks ago to career printed materials, as well as flash drives for students who need them uh, so that they, can, they don't have to be disadvantaged. But of course, this time of lockdown has put a lot of pressure on all kinds of people. And so we have kept our um, uh, student wellness services running online as they, they, they did even before students left. Mm -hmm. 
all students can still book their sessions online as usual um, uh, on, our, uh, on our student affairs, student wellness booking platform to secure a slot, or they can just email for an appointment and our counselors and healthcare practitioners are sharing digital online health and mental health self-help tips for students to manage anxiety, to cope with remote learning, and also how to cope with physical distancing because some students yes. have found that difficult. And, 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 and so we, 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 our, our student care line has been really active in terms of students texting um, and, and, and telephoning, calling to get support from the university. Our social workers are available and they're offering telephonic and digital psychosocial support. And some of this work, of course, if it, there was no lockdown, they would be doing face-to-face. -face. Now yes. it all happens online. Usually they have a choice online or face-to-face. -face. We have uh, referral letters to other health facilities and external services, um, uh, which we email to students upon request via email because some students discover their mental health issues whilst on campus. And now that they're at home, they need uh, referral letters from our, our social workers uh, and, and we, we offer those. I think one thing, uh, because I can see my time is running, is to, if you allow me, I just want to uh, say everything because I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave. We, one of the things that uh, we, we, we've been doing as a result of the lockdown um, is to look closely at um, the volume of students who are requiring uh, support. Uh, through our student care line during lockdown. And we've been monitoring what kinds of challenges are they registering with us? And that's very interesting. So we've looked at uh, what, what are the issues that they're raising and the, in terms of the numbers, um, the numbers for March and April are actually lower as compared to the same months last year, right? Um, of course, students were on vacation from mid-March yes. uh, with no much academic pressure. Um, and we started the, once we started the orientation week, we saw the number of students experiencing anxiety, anxiety in terms of what would happen to the academic year and how the remote learning would work uh, started, the numbers started rising. And so, and so the, or, once we started with orientation week, sort of that, that as it, orientation week proceeded, that got, got better. But we see in March, Anxiety and depression, anxiety and depression in February was at 23%, but in March it rose up to 46%. And then yeah. in April it went down to 19%. So we are looking at that detail because we are trying to figure out what are the new issues that come as a result uh, when students are on lockdown um, in terms of uh, uh, mental health and, 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 and what are the new issues and, and, and how much of that. So we see in March, one of the new issues that's emerging, that's like a 20% is family issues. And yeah. that issue wasn't there in January, February, but we see it in March. We see academic issues coming up at about 7% in April. And, and that's, that shows like as the pressure goes, goes onto the academic side, you can see that uh, the data shows that shift. Uh, but, but it's just for us to be able to support our students. We need to understand where, why are they experiencing these pressures and, and how is it that we can tweak our support to make sure that uh, they are better served. Thank you very much, Steph. Certainly. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Pagang. And I think that it's interesting that um, the family issues uh, are far more uh, in this period than they were last year. And I think it's because students are at home, right? Uh, and so the things that they would be distant from when they are on campus um, are not there now. I think the other very important thing is that for so many people, uh, mental, so many mental health conditions begin to manifest in that 18 to 21, 18 to 22 period. Um, and so it is a very difficult period anyway in any human being's life. So thank you so much uh, for those inputs. Uh, Professor Paking, uh, is it time for you, I think, to log off with us? Uh, yes. According to my watch, it's 12.15. It's, it's 14.15. So um, would you thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and yeah, all the best for what you have to do today. Thanks very much, Tamila. All the best. Thanks. Bye. Uh, Prof Kupe, I'm going to now, now you're on the higher education uh, hot seat, I want to just draw uh, some of the issues uh, that Prof Pagin was trying to speak to. Um, around the 
mental health challenges that students are facing, particularly being uh, at home in places that may not be conducive to studying, but then also all of these other um, infrastructural issues uh, that many young people are having to deal with. Um, what sort of support services uh, have, and with, we can speak about UP directly, but also within the university sector, as you've moved towards this uh, emergency remote learning, what kind of discussions are taking place about the, the infrastructure to have uh, in support for students? Uh, Prof, I think you're still muted. Thank you, Dr. Mbete, and good afternoon to my fellow panelists. I think as uh, Professor Pakeng said, essentially we all have had, in a sense, to be pushed to the online uh, offerings, which were, which were there in the past, but uh, were not uh, necessarily the only option for a student. A student could opt to walk in after booking online or sending an email. What we're finding at University of Pretoria and some of our PSA is the same thing is that Ironically, many students are finding it, more students are finding it easier to actually access a counseling precisely because there's also been a stigma around the walking or the face-to-face. -face. So, 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 so not in the most ideal conditions, but online is actually ensuring that many students actually access the kind of uh, counseling services they would not. Second, an increasing number of students, also, although they go online, they actually want to do the video and as we are doing right now, online counseling with video. Some do not want video because they want that anonymity. What's also happening is that students are also acting in peer groups. So there are WhatsApp groups. There are also support groups of students. We have a partner at UP Sander, which everyone knows is South African Education and Anxiety Group. Today, by the way, it's a bipolar day. And they, the, what they are doing is they are guiding our students with their online groups and WhatsApp groups in, in, in giving each other peer support. We are also creating a WhatsApp a application as I speak right now, which will, students will be able to use as well. So if you like, um, one should not say so behaviorally in this context, but every uh, cloud has a silver lining. One of the silver linings in this context is that we are finding many more modes that could be used successfully for online counseling once we return to some degree of normalcy, because one can no longer talk about normalcy with <laughs> COVID, and there's no real post-COVID, by the way. It's like, you know, the particular phase of COVID that one will actually reach. So I think that, that, that we're finding that perhaps this period might give legitimacy to accessing counseling when you are anxious. Yes. We noticed particularly at the University of Pretoria that for the first time, anxiety and people talking about depression. Of course, these things are interconnected, the professionals will tell us. But most students are saying, I am anxious. Anxious about my disrupted studies. Anxious about my tests. Anxious about the technology. Anxious because, as Prof. Parkeng said, I'm in family conditions that uh, I thought I had escaped. And this is not, not, not necessarily students who are in, coming from poor backgrounds or poor families or indigenous families. Even students who are coming from white -way families do not necessarily like the environment of being home. Mm -hmm. Remember, some of us here might have done that, is that you wanted to go to live and raise and go to university far off from your parents. When you could have gone to invest in the local town, you went all the way to Cape Town. I don't mean you, Dr. Mbete. <laughs> but it was to escape from parental control. Yeah. And now you are forced to right back in. And, and also all of the associations you were beginning to form. Particularly those who have been hit hard. It's many categories, but also first year students. Remember, first year has only been there barely seven weeks. They started to form new associations, enjoy the freedom of no uniform, no principal, and not the kind of principal like me. Nobody actually wanted to me, a high school principal like <laughs> me. But now, all of this, even form romantic relationships, enjoy going out without being asked, when are you coming back and so on. All that overnight was destroyed, if you like. So there's some degree of trauma about a formative stage in your idea. 
that is affecting a range of students. So at the University of Pretoria, what we had actually done was, uh, we had say two types of students could stay in res even during the lockdown. And we have 207 such stay. Students from such poor backgrounds that staying at home was not going to be conducive. And international students, some decided to go, but some stayed behind. Because we were very uh, conscious that those kinds of students would find it much more difficult being at home. But the international students, some, some of them could not get to the airport or get on the road before the lockdown happened. And also might not have had the financial yeah. use. Indigent students, we wanted to have that safe environment more conducive to learning. So they are finding now with online that they can access university resources, albeit in their residences. They are not allowed, of course, to walk all over the place in the university. There are no contact classes and so on. So I think that uh, they are, this is a teachable moment for student counseling. We could develop the online offerings much more. We could have a multimodal approach where there is PA learning. We could use more of the technologies. We can pull in more professional partners like Sandag and others. Now, I've been thinking that what I would do soon actually is to launch an appeal to our alumni who are psychologists and professionals and counselors who mentor young people, especially once as, as the lockdown develops, that they can assist us with forms of counseling. We are going to you might know, going to be hiring a lot of tutors to assist students with telephone tutoring. So if, imagine if I could aid alumni who are professionals to aid to that capacity. Because yeah. university is always struggling with capacity for counseling, even in good times. Yeah. That's why we partner Sandak and others. So I think it's a great opportunity for us actually to always be conscious that counseling is an ongoing need for people in university, which is a transitional, which comes with this even at best of times, comes with its own stresses, including for PhD students like Ms. Marciane and, and, and so on. So that counseling had to become part of an integral offering that does not stigmatize anyone. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought. Uh, I just want to make a point uh, to everyone that there is, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat function and there's a Q&A function. So any questions that you have to ask our panelists, please feel free to ask them during uh, the course of the discussion and I will be reading them out uh, as, as we go through. So anything you'd like to ask, any comments you have to make, you can do that in the chat and in the Q&A. Prof Kobe, I want to thank you for, for, for bringing up a number of issues around the kind of disruption uh, that this COVID-19 um, has given to young people at a very formative stage of their lives. Um, you know, the, what you're saying about the trauma of being in first year, and you know, I remember being in Cape Town for the first time uh, as a 18, 19 year old, and you're going out, no one's asking you when you're coming home. You've got this freedom and this taste of adulthood. And now that's been cut short uh, by this crisis and the lockdown and all of those responses and so that trauma indeed for those students and also for final year students for example who thought that they were on a particular track to to, to, to leaving a uh, university uh, and now have the anxiety around that i think that one of the things that is also very important um is that you're saying that there's more people talking about anxiety that there's a, a greater normalization uh, of the conversation around feeling anxious, around feeling um, under pressure uh, in, in terms of mental health, that is very important. In the first um, two panels that we've had, um, you know, part of what we were talking about was that feeling anxious, feeling worried, feeling panicked is a normal response to a global pandemic. Uh, no one's been through this you know, very few people who are alive have been through this kind of thing before. Um, and so, of course, being anxious is normal. Um, and I think that this has been a really positive thing um, from, the, from the pandemic is that people are speaking far more openly uh, about mental health issues, which I think does assist with some of the stigma uh, that we normally have around mental health, particularly in African communities. So yeah, that's, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you, Prof. I want to bring you in, Ms. Mashiane, here. Uh, Prof. Pagenga and Prof. Kube have spoken a lot about 
about students and how students are responding uh, at universities in relation to uh, to COVID-19. Um, and I'm going to go back to Prof. Kupi to ask about staff. But I'd like to come to you, Ms. Mashene, as a human resources specialist, as somebody that is, uh, you know, in the HR space broadly and in networks of many uh, employers, what are you seeing generally um, about uh, the kind of mental distress that employees in general are under um, during this time. Thank you, Dr. Mbete, and good afternoon to my fellow panelists in the house at large. Uh, from an employer perspective, um, I must say that the impact of COVID has brought about the change of the narrative of the employer-employee relationship, which was, as we know, it was more the master servant relationship. And it has changed that narrative from a principle of looking at the workplace as a place of comfort, rather just a place of a job security. It has come to a point where the employers have changed the way they interact with people because the circumstances surrounding the issue of COVID, as everyone has alluded to it, are unprecedented, which has brought about a new way of thinking how we see business and how we see our people. And in that, um, we have looked in terms of putting a number of interventions in place, and obviously counseling as you know, the fellow speakers has also, a panelist has alluded to being one of the key, uh, one to drive the issues of mental health, but more than anything to change the perspective of how we view the life of a worker and striking that work-life balance. Overextending your services from just being an employer but to be an employer of choice and as well as the employer of communities and families. With that being said, um, your, your, your wellness program cannot just stop at the level of your employee. They need to be extended to the family because the employee comes from a community. They don't like come from a vacuum. So yeah. with that being said, the reaching out programs that we have to put in place have to be very robust. But also, I think it changed the narrative in terms of the working pattern in the South African culture and organizations. How we used to actually think that actually working is when people are sitting in their desk in your workplace. We have now actually changed our mindset as employers in a way that we now giving people remote working tools and support and that has actually, from where I'm sitting, forced the leadership to start instilling a sense of collaboration, but also a sense of change management in their own thinking by supporting the workforce to actually starting to move along the whole issue of industrial revolution, which issue I think was quite an open-ended debate for South Africa because we are, we are just a country that was not really embracing technology at the level which we are now. Yeah. So we have seen opportunities as far as the use of technology. We have seen that companies can really function remotely. People don't need to be sitting in their desk. And I think it's gonna really change going forward. It's gonna change the narrative of the working life of an employee in South Africa. And what's beautiful about the, 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 the COVID, even though it has brought so much stress, is the collaboration of all the stakeholders. We have seen how the unions have started to engage meaningfully with management and how we are putting forward our views and leaving the legalistic approach and putting more the human factor forward. And that is for me, it's, 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 it's a takeaway of how we have used the opportunity of COVID to enhance, promote, as well as to form collabor uh, collaborative as well as lasting partnerships with our stakeholders, including the industry and all other key stakeholders like the higher, uh, institution of higher learning, like the various industry and sector mm. bodies that, govern, that governs 
you know, various industries, purely because this was just a common denominator for all of us and nobody could find a better way of navigating except for us understanding those relationships and how critical they are. And lastly, I think uh, it has also taught the leadership to balance the IQ versus the EQ. Leadership mostly because it, it, it happens to be your highly talented workforce that sits in those positions. And you tend to find that their emotional intelligence in terms of people's issues is not there. They expect HR to drive that. But then with the COVID, we have started to really engage and we have seen a good balance in terms of our own emotional intelligence as human you know, resources people, as well as the balancing of the IQ for those that drive the economy. And we have now put our thoughts together and that balance has actually changed how leadership as well as organization view the workplace uh, for the better for everyone. And I think uh, with that being said, I, I would like to just close it there, um, Dr. Mbete, because uh, I'm very passionate about the subject. <laughs> and I will, I'll definitely come back to you. And thank you so much for raising, you know, there's something about a kind of an existential crisis, life or death, which is exactly yeah. what this COVID thing, that reminds us that we're human. And so I yeah. find it so interesting that you're saying that, you know, it's humanized workplaces. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's brought a lot more of a thought of a workplace as a place of comfort, a place you need to yeah. feel safe in, not just where you're making money for, for, yeah. for, for, for a boss. Um, but also that it is having us, you know, in, in, in South Africa, and I think because of our history, we've had such a hierarchical view of working mm -hmm. um, and this master servant, you know, dynamic in so many of our workplaces that this is shifting things to a more collaborative yeah. approach because everyone is dealing with a new situation mm. um, and I think what's important also is that a new situation where it can affect everyone no matter what class you're in no matter you know race everybody is equally in, is, is endangered in a similar way um, with this. So thank you. Thank you so much for those insights. I'd like to just uh, take a pause quickly to welcome Dr. Precious Muloy Muzipe onto the line. Thank you so much uh, for, I know there was a bit of issues with joining into the call, um, but would you like to say a few words? Oh, thank you, Dr. Stembile. And I um, just wanted to thank our panelists uh, for making time to connect with students and workers. Um, and uh, we were once students uh, many, many years ago, and we know how challenging university environment can be. And now with uh, COVID um, upon us, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges have just been amplified. The same with the workplace as a group employ very many people, and I'm glad to uh, get um, feedback from Busi, Ms. Busi Mashiani and uh, Mr. Buyani Zwani who will also speak to us from a perspective of leaders in business and in corporations on how we navigate through um, the mental stresses that this uh, virus has brought um, to us and to the nation. Thank you, Stembile. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. T. Uh, Mr. Zwane, you know, just building on, on what Ms. Mashene was saying about the needs or the focus now on emotional intelligence, on humanity uh, in, in business. Um, how are you seeing that in terms of your work with leaders? Uh, we focus so much about employees and staff members, but really, uh, you know, how what are leaders meant to be doing to be able to manage uh, the, the, this crisis and what kind of skills and competencies do we need them to be demonstrating at this time? Well, Dr. Melissa, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to engage and it's absolutely a pleasure. Among others, of course, because we engage with leaders from all walks of life. In the work that we do, we get to be able to uh, send out surveys, questionnaires, as it were, to our clients to get a sense of where they are at, what are the issues that they're grappling with. But what has become very clear is that COVID-19 has actually forced us to become more of leaders than more of managers, because it's asking of us to be able to rise above the, uh, what everybody else is dealing with to getting to a point of appreciating that direction is what is needed above all other things. 
Um, as uh, Ms. Mashiano is highlighting the importance as it were, of emotional intelligence, we're beginning to be able to appreciate, among other things, that as we have our children at home, um, all of the people who are involved in business are now getting to be able to look into where they had been outsourcing the looking after of their children. They're beginning to have to be the, uh, <laughs> the homeschoolers, as it were. And that is presenting a new competency that they need to be able to have. And that competency is calling on to getting into a point of, I just don't use my authority over the ones that I have in front of me, I need to be able to influence. And that is a leadership competency. You see, in management, it's easy to be able to dictate and, and tell what needs to be done. But in the space of leadership, influencing becomes all the more important. Now, what has often been happening um, amongst people in the workplace now, and they're sharing this with us, is we're beginning to appreciate the pressures that our staff are dealing with on a regular basis. We thought it was very easy to be able to just say, be at work at eight o'clock and we will see you off at 4.30 and you'll be out of here. Now we're beginning to be able to appreciate the significance of two key things, purpose and productivity. Are the people that we're working with being purposeful at the start of the day are they engaging in the things that make sense to them? And then things that make sense to the organization. What prioritization comes through? As happens with virtually any change that is coming through to any organization. Of course, this is, the word has been used over and over, has been unprecedented in the sense that there really isn't a clear precedent we could be following despite the fact that we've had SARS as one of the areas that we could easily be able to make reference to, but we kind of like look at it and say, ah, it was something that was happening in the Asia. So yeah. It didn't last that much. So we kind of like uh, push ourselves aside. Now we've got something that is right here in our, in our shores, and we're actually quite uh, struggling with the fact that we can't even visualize it. We can't yeah. even see it but it's, it's something that we need to be able to grapple with. So many of our clients are presenting through to us that they're having to be able to address themselves in four specific areas. One, themselves. How do they cope with the challenges of leading when managing was easy? How do they actually get to be able to speak to themselves, which is self-leadership? How do they then get to be able to lead the people that they are with? Second, how do they get their teams to be able to focus? Because purposefulness requires an interplay of focus and energy, and that which the people have. Now, when you are in a home situation where you are homeschooling and you're still required to be able to deliver results for the organization, your energy is being sapped very early in the day. By the time you're required to be able to really be bringing your best thought processes, you're thoroughly exhausted, which means many of the people that we're working with are highlighting that they are finding the focus and staying on purpose being very tricky. The third and critical area that leaders are needing to be able to pay attention to is what's happening with our customers, because we exist for as long as they are customers. When our customers are struggling, one, to make ends meet, to pay their bills, to respond to the invoices that we've given through to them, it's a challenge. Second, how do we actually get to be able to be there and render and offer a helping hand to our, um, to, to our customers themselves so that we are actually able to alleviate the challenges that they may be grappling with? How do we sort that out? It's an issue. And then finally, many executives are, are finding themselves challenged in terms of how they get to be seen in society. Are they seen as caring enough to be able to look into situations where, for argument's sake, everybody's talking to the importance of sanitization, but how is my organization responding to be able to help the informal settlement uh, 
closest to me, to our working environment. And then they're beginning to be able to ask, well, we've got many of our staff who are in various locations. How do they get to be able to still carry the badge of the organization and speak as ambassadors to those societies? It's becoming a challenge. So those are some of the things to look into. Thanks, thanks, thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Zwan. And actually, what you're saying some now about how leaders are seen in society, I think one of the very interesting things um, around this crisis is all of these think pieces and opinion pieces that have been written about the difference between um, men and women political leaders, so that countries that are led by women seem to have uh, dealt with this better. Uh, and another interesting one that I read made the distinction that it's not so much the a person's sex, so whether they're a man or a woman, but it's about kind of gendered leadership. So what we've seen is that macho masculine leadership is completely out of place in this kind of crisis. Uh, and the kind of uh, responses that we associate with women or with femininity of compassion, kindness, understanding, listening, um, are far um, more appropriate and actually have been far more successful uh, in helping leaders navigate this. And so what you're saying about leaders thinking about how they're viewed in society is that in the sort of often very macho culture that we have in South Africa, people are thinking about, you know, do people think that I'm kind, that I'm responding with compassion, yep. uh, that I'm helping? Um, and all of these things that we often have not associated with being a leader uh, yep. in, in exactly in our society. And I think that that's so important. Something that you've uh, mentioned makes, I want to ask, uh, Prof Kupe, uh, some questions just building on what you said, um, because, you know, I, I, many of our students are challenged at the moment by the self-leadership and the needing to focus, um, yeah. because it's much easier to do that within the context uh, of the university. Uh, Prof Kupe, I'd like to ask you um, some questions, uh, just building on questions that have been asked in the Q&A. Uh, the one is um, about what measures UP has put in place to account for postgraduate students, uh, because it, this person says, you know, it feels like the focus is on undergrads, yet we as postgrads are equally affected as part of the student community. Um, and somebody's asking about, you know, the students that don't have the resources to do online learning. Um, what's the resolution for this issue um, and what action is being taken by the sector in general, but also government to assist with those people. And then prof, a final question that's come in is from uh, Bandile, who says that they're studying CTA, I'm not quite sure what that is at the University of Joburg, um, and they want to ask a question about tests and examinations. Will the universities keep to their initial standard to ensure that final year students are equipped for the workplace? Um, or will there be adjustments to the standards of the exams uh, in order to assure, um, you know, to account for the disruption uh, that the pandemic has caused to academics? So I suppose this is also a question about the kind of engagement that universities are, are involved in with um, with industry to say, you know, for those certificates, for those uh, qualifications um, that require some industry uh, endorsement, are universities going to account for that in their assessments? Uh, Prof. Kupe, I take that. Take it away. Uh, unmute, please. Uh, I forget that. Uh, and I hope <laughs> we can muzzle ourselves and then we have to unmuzzle ourselves when we speak. So, so you did also raise the question of staff, by the way, if you don't mind, I could just say one or two Please. things in light of what my colleagues who actually did a brilliant job of focusing on staff and management and leadership. In, in universities as well, of course, there's a tendency also to just focus on students and as the postgraduate student says, focus on undergrad, then some other people become invisible. University staff have also suffered anxiety, including teaching staff anxiety about having to teach online, having to assess online. And also when lockdown happened, quite a lot of uh, university staff, academic staff 
left their offices and left a lot of their books and research materials in the offices. So one of the things I've had to deal with is staff saying, I finished reading the books that I've been reading at home. I need more books, what do we do? So we've been able within the confines of the law, make a plan for them, which by the way included the GOP going into rooms of students who say they left their computers and devices in their rooms. So far to date, we have actually managed to Korea or send by post office about 400 laptops, computers, and iPads, and so on. So there is anxiety on the staff, and the range of anxiety is for academic staff, students, and also for all staff who wondered whether they would continue to be paid, whether they will be retrenched. Because also if the university is closed and is not making money, and when they heard that some students wanted reductions in fees, our uh, income is dependent on fees. That caused a lot of anxiety. Researchers were also worried about experiments running in the lab and you are not checking on them. They have had to make a plan around that. And then also, staff have also worried about being home and being a teacher when you are not being trained to be a teacher, homeschooling the kids. Because many parents are not teachers. They can't certainly start teaching now. And also it meant that they, were, they are very concerned now, the anxiety levels are going up now is if kids don't go back to school, they can't also go back to work under lockdown version where I say you must now come back to work. So some of the constant uh, uh, emails I get from staff is, when am I expected to get back to work? Is, does my job still exist? Are you going to retrench me? So all of those things have been a particular. My approach as you might have seen is that I've on a regular basis either sent written messages or did videos that were sent to all staff. In those videos, I was trying to answer some of those questions to a broader audience because not many staff access the counseling services. The counseling services are actually not just for students, but it's never, people's mentality has never been that way. And also, I think many staff often use counseling services in their private capacity, their own counselors, through their own medical aid. Or, or even through their religious uh, faiths or through their own traditional uh, practices. But we actually do cater for, for staff as well. So I sent one particular video to University of Pretoria health workers because they were in the front, forefront of fighting. They are in the forefront of fighting COVID. In fact, last week, is we, we lost one top professor who was a professor, Anton Stoltz, who was actually a, a top expert on COVID. He didn't die of COVID died of other uh, 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 complications related to his health, but not of COVID, it was not, it was not uh, positive or anything. Also to our essential services staff, who never left campus, the security guards working on a rotational basis, people looking after, uh, of course, at the University of Pretoria, we're an agricultural and the only virtual university. We have so many animals, cows, horses, we have cows, yes. cats, and everything. Those, they, we couldn't just leave them and, and, and look at. So, so we've been dealing also with those kinds of anxieties. And also, uh, last year, let me put it this way, and, and, and if you don't mind, I could tell a slight story. Once upon a time, and a, a woman worked for me, and she, retired, she, she reached retirement age. And we, I did a party for her, and she left. After three weeks in January, she came back, knowing I was back from holiday, and said, Prof, can I have some part-time work? I said, but you're going to be on you are looking to retirement spending time with your husband she said no I, the thought of spending the whole day with him is not enough <laughs> there are also some of those things yeah like of families now suddenly being put together for longer periods than they normally would it, it produces some very difficult family dynamics we have had students right to us saying that my parents are saying, why am I sitting around reading on a laptop instead of helping with the housework? Mm -hmm. Who do I think I am? And so all of those family dynamics also require consideration. Now to the questions that have been asked. For the postgraduate students, what we have tried to do is there are two categories of postgraduate students. Those who are doing just research only, and those who are also doing coursework. They're doing some actually courses they're being taught, so they'll be provided for online. Those who are doing research, Essentially what we've been encouraged and supported is that their supervisors should do some bit of online supervision. That's not something that we've been used to because as a, a contact university, you, you cherish those moments where, and of course we're up against it. 
when you went to the professor or the, 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 the lecturer's office to actually receive your feedback on your chapters. And the chapter was not what it should be, or the proposal was not what it should be. Contact was better. Then also access to the libraries and access to laboratories for science students. That there has been a very major constraint. That's why we're looking forward to level three. Under level three, remember, we've been allowed a category of students to come back, final year students, postgrad students needing to access research materials. So we will open the libraries, for example. I paid also for certain hours, so because they have to be sanitized every day. We'll open the laboratory for appropriate students and so on. So they are very much in our mind, in our mind, eight year international students. So we recently completed at the University of Victoria a massive exercise to trace, find, and contact every postgraduate student and ask them what their, their, their circumstances are. We discovered that 60% of even some of our international students did not necessarily leave the country. They are actually in country. 40% have been trying to lobby their authorities to say, can't we have an AU subject dispensation to bring back all international students and with all of the quarantine and all of that and all of that, because we're very conscious of their needs. In relation to students without online infrastructure, so we have a, a, a two-pronged strategy. We bought laptops for students who didn't have any laptop because financially their family or themselves could not do so. Up to date, we have, I think, distributed over 2000, just over 2,000 uh, laptops. In fact, as I sit here, we have a few more laptops left. And again, our host, uh, uh, Dr. Precious Mosebe, through the Family Foundation, gave us about four million to buy uh, computers. Among other people like Aspen Pharmacare that gave us 600, you know, iPads for medical students. And so we also repurposed the budgets of the university, created an internal solidarity fund so that anyone who needs a, a laptop does. <laughs> the most interesting thing about this, by the way, is so we use the post office to distribute the laptops and we check whether a person wanted one and they had to sign that is a loan. You know that 253 laptops were returned back to us by students who then said, ah, Really? And, and, and <laughs> I don't know what happened there. However, <laughs> it's good that at least we reached them. Then the second category is those students who, even if I give them a laptop, there's no electricity or there's no connectivity or it's too yeah. much. We are sending, we also have just completed a trace, find, contact, and we're sending my uh, hard copy materials. We're going to layer it with the twice a week, one hour tutoring. By, so we're hiring a number of tutors. Some of our partners have advanced as fans who hire tutors to actually do telephone or online tutoring to our students. So if you like, we're trying to work with a concept we call no student left behind although we are achieving that no student left behind progressively rather than instantaneous. Some people okay. in the already and others didn't have. Tracing and finding and contacting them was a challenge, especially under, under lockdown five and four. We couldn't, for example, one way the computer sent them to it because it was not allowed until a government gazette came allowing us to do that. Now the gentleman of the CTA is one of the first uh, professional exams you write in accounting. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw his uh, Vandile, I think his name, I saw his question coming up. I think Vandile raises a very, you'll be right to be anxious, he raises a, 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 an important question. That professional exam is very, very important uh, and leads you into the profession. So what we're doing there is working together with the professional bodies, SICA and others, the accounting authorities, to determine what kind of assessments and tests that capture the essence of what you ought to learn as a professional would be acceptable in this particular kind of context. So as you ask your question, yes, we are working with the industry and the professional and regulatory bodies in that sphere to, to actually, in a sense, come to an understanding that nobody costs COVID-19. It's not the student studying CTA. It's, yes. not the, it's not the industry. It's a global phenomenon. But how do we ensure professional standards are maintained? I think you work together to look at what is the core element that a professional should actually know. So what are the make-up lectures, tutorials, summer schools? So at UP, we are going to be looking at summer schools, tutorials, internships. We're also, you could have added the internships. There are people who need internships in order to complete. 
they are going to be coming back under level three, for example, as appropriate to be able to fulfill those requirements that are needed for you to join a professional, to be registered as a professional, and to begin to take professional steps and exams. That is, uh, thank you uh, so much, Prof. And thank you for explaining CTA. You know, as humanities people, there's some things that we, <laughs> we never really learn. Um, but I think that, you know, it's very important uh, what you've described about the engagement between universities and professional associations, because so you know, students um, are not at university for its own sake you know it's also to be able to enter professions to be able to enter the world of work um, and so engaging with other stakeholders about how that can be possible I think is really really important um, and thank you also for highlighting the counseling services for staff I'm going to uh, it, it helps me bridge to something I want to ask Ms. Mashiane because often uh, employees are often quite suspicious of employer wellness programs um, because there's always this concern that it can be, you know, used against you or, or whatever the, the issues are. And so I'd like to ask you uh, about, about how, um, you know, employees can access whatever the programs are that are available to them um, from different uh, uh, employers. Um, because there's a question here from uh, Triforza about that in the corporate workplace, so this is a question I'm going to direct to you, uh, are we seeing employee assistance programs being used during this crisis? Um, and are workplace budgets being uh, adjusted to accommodate uh, COVID-19? Um, so that uh, people can be able to, to access those uh, within their employers. And then there's another question here directed to you about your specific work, um, Ms. Mashiane. Um, what measures does ARN have in place to protect its workplace, uh, its workforce from COVID-19, especially the miners, given the cases that have been recorded um, in SA mines? Apparently, there's 200 cases just from um, Boning mine. Um, can you give us, uh, uh, yeah, let us know about, um, about how you guys are, in, are, are dealing with that. And then there was a question here also from Bandile to you, Ms. Mashiane. Um, I'm very aware of the current rate of unemployment in our country. In spite of the sad reality, what are the skills that graduates, the unemployed and final year students can be developing during this pandemic to make sure that they're in a position to be equipped and good leaders in the workplace? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mbete. Uh, I will first respond to the question that is mining specific because that is close to my heart. Yes. <laughs> um, in as far as uh, African rainbow specifically, as in as far as what we're doing, African rainbow minerals contributes to the Chamber of Mines, which, which is a one body, it's now called the Mineral Council. That is the one body that regulates our industry through the Mineral Health Council as well, as well as the application of the Health and Safety Act. As a result of that, for mining industry at large, there are protocols in place in terms of how we need to deal with the recall of workers. And as you would appreciate that the industry was on care maintenance at the beginning of the pandemic and during that phase already, we started putting measures in place. And those measures, as I indicated, that they governed largely by the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, as well as the Code of Good Practice that comes from the, all the stakeholders, which is driven from the Mineral Council desk. So from the various structures, there is a structure which speaks to the day-to-day -day livelihood of miners, which sit at the Chamber of Mine, and there are COVID streams of meetings that happen under that body. There is also a CEO structure, which largely looks at the broader strategic business overview of mining and the future of mining during these trying times. And that structure comes back to the workplace and enforce certain protocols and guidelines that we need to apply to make sure that our workers are safe. 
you would also appreciate that the history of mining in South Africa comes with a lot of challenges of safety, which has forced the industry to be zero tolerant to harm. And as a result, the application of those standards becomes part of our second nature as miners. So yes, I, I want to put it forward to say that we have quite good measures in place. Um, I wouldn't really like to dwell on the statistics uh, of other mining houses. However, what I can talk about, I can talk about our specific environment and how we've safeguarded our employees in relation to the protocols and the guidelines as well as the code of good practice as we were informed and supported and being prescribed by, by the Mineral Council and the regulator. Coming to the question in terms of the wellness, uh, if the workplace has the budget and how do we safeguard the confidentiality of workers in relation to that. The programs that workplace has in place, firstly, I think I just need to give a background to say that how does the world of human resources work? Because the world of human resources is pretty much your human element world which is very much an industrial psychological world. And that world forces you to have certain code of ethics that governs your discipline. As you would appreciate, one of the bodies that uh, governs our discipline is the Health Professional Council of South Africa, where which body look in terms of how we deal with the workers from a psychometric point of view, which talks largely to the psychology of the mind of the worker. With that being said, if you are an HR professional, you would need to go through certain steps. And even though you are not necessarily a practicing psychotechnician or a psychometric or a psychologist, you are governed by certain rules in terms of your ethical code. We also do have a body of social code of ethics of South Africa that as a company you need to abide by. We're also members of the South African Board of People Practices, which also governs our level of confidentiality as well as ethics. So the whole conversations really start from an ethical uh, mindset from an employer perspective. And with that being said, you screen your HR professionals very well so that they keep the confidentiality of the life of the worker into their heart and they don't take that information out. However, because we also understand the anxiety that comes with the whole stigma around issues of anxiety, the issues of depression, the issues of counseling. We outsource certain services. And yes, uh, as companies, we use mostly bodies like ICAS, where the counseling session is not necessarily just for the worker, but it's extended to the family, and the reports are very confidential. All what you do as the employer is to refer, and once you've done the referral, they don't even give you the report. What you need to assess in terms of the progress of the employee is to see if there's any behavioral changes. And all what you do, you can then ask the, 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 the psychologist behind the employee support to just engage you on those issues that are non-intruding uh, to the employee's life to help you facilitate the conversation and support the employee. In terms of the budget, yes, I would imagine that um, that would have been one of the key things. I mean, we, 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 we as employers are kept awake at night because remember, you still have a workforce that you want to pay. You still have a workforce that you want to retain as far as possible. You do not want to use retrenchment as the, you know, as the vehicle to actually uh, get away and, um, you know, do away with people and blame it to COVID. So yes, I would imagine that one of the key strategic things that we need to do is to review your budget. We also look in terms of the Department of Labor where the financial distressed organizations were called upon to say that if you are unable to pay your workforce for whatever reason, as long as you can you have a business case for it, the government is facilitating that support structure. And we are tapping into those structures as and when required. And for, all, for, 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 for the bigger part of uh, the workforce in mining, we appreciate that we are now going back to pretty much you know, full production very soon on the 1st of June. 
And even though we're still sitting on the one third of production, but then we're still on care maintenance. So basically on your care maintenance over and above, you've added the one third. So there is no way that you cannot review your budget. You cannot review your production um, strategy. You cannot review your, your business plan because everything that you deal with talks to the bottom line of the business. And with that being said, you, 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 you have to find a balance of a way of balancing, you know, everything in terms of your business, uh, your operational requirements, your human factor uh, requirements, your socioeconomic issues in terms of your communities, still also satisfying your regulators in terms of the commitments that you've made from a social labor plan point of view. So there is a holistic view in terms of your budgeting processes that you need to review and refine based on the issue of COVID and the mining houses that I at least work for is, you know, working around that. And then coming to the question in terms of the skills, that's a very interesting one. And I must say that as a head of HR in a quite big organization, that has been keeping me awake at night. But I will share what I have done in terms of just facilitating the assurance to our upcoming young talent because skills development falls within our strategic pillar. We have four strategic pillars. One of our pillar is talent management framework. Uh, based on the talent management framework is skills development. The second one is talent management, which talks to the workforce planning. Then the third one talks to learning and development. And that's the learning and development speaks to both the worker as well as those that are still coming from uh, our timber. So with that being said, um, our still skills development approach is such that we have a graduate development pool that is under our wing. The, 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 the pool uh, the, the team of those graduates are located in various institutions around South Africa. We do have a Baza ambassador program as well, which uh, Babuzwane has facilitated for us many, many moons ago when we started it. And those are the platforms that we've been engaging. And fortunately, we have not just started engaging now from an employer point of view in terms of bringing the ambassadors as well as our graduates on board. We've been engaging, we've been offering psychological support in terms of the learning, you know, the learnings as well as the life of Elena. And now with COVID, it's just more really to re, you know, reinforce our efforts and just make sure that everybody is getting the benefit of actually being still feeling good about their learning experiences and being kept in our books for our learnership program. Coming to the skills and the, the, the development of young talent, as I started earlier, I did say that that does keep me awake at night, but I had to kind of set the scenario. Yes. We continue, we, 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 we want to believe that as employers, we need to continue to pull the skills and pull the talent that we think is important for our organization and our country at large. <clears throat> but more than anything, I think this is the time and the opportunity to educate other skills. When one looks at the World Economic, um, uh, World Economic Forum report in terms of the skills of the future, the skills of the future are, are, are not going to be talking what we are, we are today. The certain skills are going to be depleted and uh, robotics is going to be taking over some part of that. So the focus now, we need to change to say that, how do we channel our young talent to be aligned with the global, you know, with the global uh, um, protocol uh, in terms of the skills of the future? How do they get to align themselves with what the world is going to be needing and have a different conversation? We cannot have the same type of conversation and expect different results. But the other thing that we really need, I think that as a nation, we need to start looking at, we need to look at developing entrepreneurs. Yes. We need to afford an opportunity for these young stars to go to university and be business leaders that can come back and impact their societies by being entrepreneurs that makes a difference to the broader community. And with that being said, I think that just closes uh, up my, 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 my summary on the questions. 
but I want to just assure the youngsters and the young talent out there to say that with all the collaborative efforts amongst all stakeholders, amongst government, amongst organized labor, amongst communities, as well as the business leaders like the likes of uh, Mr. Zwane and the educational institutions, we can actually change the mindset of South Africa in terms of developing people and retaining people in business as well as giving a sense of dignity to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive answer, Ms. Mashane, and for just focusing also on explaining how some of the HR processes actually work, which I think the people are often um, really unsure about and what kind of the ethical standards that uh, that HR practitioners need to work with and what is actually involved um, in people um, getting assistance and help uh, from HR practitioners. Um, and I just want to then turn to you, Mr. Zwan, and thank you very much for answering uh, Sibiwa's question because I think that this idea of um, you know, self-leadership, um, I think, is, is a big question uh, for many students. So I'd firstly like you uh, to just answer a question, if you can, about what you mean by that, you know, and how is it that we can inculcate or develop um, some kinds of self-leadership within ourselves, both uh, for those, for, for students, but also for those of us who um, are, are in our working lives already, uh, what kind of things can we develop uh, in order to help us uh, deal with the this current crisis. But there's also a question here um, from someone that I'm going to direct to you about from Sharon saying, how can I speak to or help someone suffering from um, mental health pressure, anxiety or depression, especially those who've lost help, hope uh, because of the COVID pandemic? I think that in as much as uh, so much of our focus today has been on people in institutions, there's a lot of people who are losing jobs, um, who are losing economic opportunities. Um, how could you, you know, what could you recommend about how uh, we can support those people? And then there's a question here from um, Pahami Solisedi, who is uh, studying HR. Uh, so it's going to be like you and 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 Ms. Marciane and says, what are some of the things that affect uh, the HR department and, and risk as a whole? Um, and looking at the risk of for IR um, and working and learning as a whole. So as an up-and-coming HR professional, uh, what should they be looking out for? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mason. Let me just go back to something that was raised by Dr. P at the beginning of this engagement, uh, highlighting among others that we really are about looking into what happens to students and what happens to workers. And therefore, the conversation that we're having, and I want to be able to address myself towards, looks into what's happening to the student population and what's happening to the people that we employ inside our organizations, who, some of whom uh, spent, have used their last bit of money to be able to send their children through to the university. And others are now needing to be able to find a situation where they've got to stretch the rent further because whilst there was an opportunity of the student being at university, being provided for, having the meals uh, provided for, now we need to be able to provide data for them to be able to engage with the uh, schooling material, um, but we also need to be able to make sure that we take care of their medical expenses, which would otherwise have been sorted out if they were on campus. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of things that are, are coming through for the parents. And as an employer, we're beginning to be able to look into how do we actually extend our hand to be able to assist them. I'd like us to be able to kind of frame the way in which we are able to address ourselves um, in assisting both the students, the parents, and then let's go beyond the both into what happens when they get back to university. Bristol kind of like helps us in this fashion, and it's useful to be able to draw a little bit of, uh, of philosophical thinking that comes from the Greeks, um, because somehow they got to be able to put things together for us. If you were to be able to imagine yourself with a triangle, um, that kind of helps you to be able to look into the steps that need to be brought into bear when we help 
the students and we help the person at work and we help the society at large. At the base of that, utilize the terminology called pathos, which has to do with empathy. There is a necessity for us to be able to step into the shoes of the people that we are helping. So even if I'm looking into the HR practitioner or budding HR practitioner who is wanting to be able to get into the profession itself, I need to be able to step into their shoes. When I've got a better appreciation of the challenges that they may very well be going through and battling with, um, I will be able to assist them better. So what happens for a student who is getting into the university and they are now at a point where they need to be able to be self-leading? How do they get to lead themselves? The beginning point is thoughts become things. What we think about the most has a way of manifesting itself in terms of the activities we engage in. Therefore, I need to be able to step into the shoes of the student who for a long time has been thinking, being in a very confined environment, the situation around them. In fact, I'm going to take the worst case scenario because there are some good case scenarios where there are people who are getting assistance, help, um, much like happens when they go through to a support system in, uh, in a club environment, as it were or there are uh, colleagues that they could be able to refer to. There are some referrals that are in place. Medical aid schemes are beginning to be able to have to address those issues. But if I were to take the worst case scenario, here is somebody who has really kind of like given up, which is like the question that was coming through from the second inquiry, as it were. How do I build them up to be able to begin to think there is something better that can still come through? Here's the thing. You are above ground for a reason. If you were not above ground, you would be somebody who we need to be able to sort out on the side and have a very few people that are allowed per level four lockdown uh, situations to be able to sort you out because you, you're not able to breathe anymore. The fact that you're alive must give you reason to be able to rise up Two, pull yourself together. One, you're breathing. You're a spirit. You are supposed to be able to make a difference. You are here to be able to make that difference. Your fingerprint tells you you're something unique to still do. Second, you are in this world to be able to not only be a difference maker, but to touch other lives, touch other people. It's not all about me. One is too small a number to be able to make all the difference. It is necessary to connect with the next person. Because when I connect with the next person, they will transfer their energy towards me while I transfer my energy towards them. The joint energies we have will turn two into three. And that's a critical thing we need to be able to bring forth in terms of self-leadership. I will achieve more when I help others and others engage with me. That's critical. And moving forward, I need to be able to think, if there is a hand that I can extend to, is it a hand that is there to support me or one that is there to push me down? Because we've got this PhD story that gets to come through, which is pull him or her down. Some push him or her down. Is it going to be that the person that I'm, I'm going to be confiding to about my shortcomings going to be working against me? Presume for a moment that they will be looking for the better things for you. So we've moved into, from the base towards empathy, let's move into the next level, which is ethos, which has everything to do with ethics. Am I going to be able to do the things that are right or wrong? Prof. Kupe has just shared something wonderful in relation to what happened when there were um, tablets that were sent out, laptops that were sent out, and there were a number that came back. That's an indication of young people who believe that it is not right to just hoard 
when you could be able to release. And there is a student out there who could benefit from this. So in some way, ethical practice that is there from the students. And when they get to learn, others are doing the same thing, they will emulate that. And guess what? That could just become the culture of the university. It's a thing to be able to support throughout. And it is vital for us to be able to do that because all universities and all business enterprises have got this value that we call integrity. And we are presuming that integrity is going to be exercised until such time that it is tested. And what these students have been able to demonstrate is that they are actually people who understand that I'm one integrated whole person. And that what I do on one side has a Thank you. critical. Finally, I think it's important to be able to think about what is logical. What is it that comes through? You were speaking, you asked earlier on about the masculine versus the feminine uh, characters coming to the fore. Too often, we've gone into logos as the way of doing things. We apply logic, you know, one plus one equals two, and, and therefore it needs to follow in that way. But we're beginning to be able to appreciate that when we let the heart lead, it enables us to beat differently. We're dealing with mental health, which really speaks to the mind, but there is a necessity for us to be able to bring it further down. As a person thinks in their heart, so they become. And that's the thing that we don't often spend a lot of time on. We always just, as a person thinks, but in their heart. Therefore, mental health has a lot to do with the heart aspect. Now, at a leadership level, what I propose and I present virtually all the time is leaders need to be able to demonstrate love and compassion. When that is in place, we will seek for the students that which we wish our children would be able to go through. We will seek for our employees that which we wish if our own children were working in this enterprise, they would be facing. So we kind of like looking into it and saying, this is me and I'm passing on to others an environment that enables them to be their true self. When they go back to their community, they are able to speak positively about what we do. Finally, the story of hope. Hope is that which leaders do. The story has been presented many, many times that leaders are dealers in hope. If I am not hopeful, chances are everyone around me is going to be hopeless. They, people can go without food, but they can't go without hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Zwane, for, 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 for those encouraging uh, words. Uh, we're going to move towards uh, closing, but I want to just uh, ask uh, Prof. Cooper to look at, you know, you've been asked lots of questions. You're in the hot seat, I suppose, as, as a person from, from university, uh, from, from the university now. But there are a, a number of questions in the question and, and answer. One of the ones that I want to highlight with you, we've spoken about uh, professional qualifications and especially, you know, we spoke around accounting. But there's a question here from a psychology student um, saying that, um, you know, if, how do we piece together adequate and effective mental health service delivery during the crisis if existing structures were inadequate even prior to the pandemic? She's saying that um, she's speaking specifically about there's a halt on incoming clinical psychologists because the exams have been paused and the existing psychologists are working at full capacity. Uh, so how then are we building the capacity to effectively handle uh, the cases that are needed? Um, and then there's a question here about what uh, psychosocial support interventions have been given uh, to students in higher education. So not just counseling, uh, but all the other social aspects. Is there any conversation on that happening within the sector? Um, and then a question here from Nonsugelelo Ngubev at the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, asking about whether students have highlighted anything in relation to GBV in their homes. We know that gender-based violence is increased quite significantly in many parts of the world um, during this crisis. Um, have students um, mentioned any issues uh, with this? And then there's a student here, Tabo, saying, um, 
how do you apply to be a tutor? Tabo, I can answer that. Contact your department uh, and ask them, contact your HOD and ask them if they will be hiring extra tutors during this time and how uh, can you uh, apply? Uh, so yes, uh, uh, Prof Kupe, I will give you an opportunity to answer uh, that question, please. Those questions, please. So, so I think that um, you, in an emergency, you cannot you cannot just invent or manufacture the capacities that you need. And this has been sectoral all over. Just look at PPE, personal protective equipment, that's all needed. Is it to be imported? Factories are to repurpose and all of that. In the context of the higher education sector, what we have, we have done is some of the things that I tried to highlight in passing, that we are finding that increasing online support for students uh, is quite more effective than the old walk-in methods. But also this is an unfolding situation, so we can't say we're dealing with this. By the way, our student counseling services are also platforms for trainee psychologists to be able to fulfill their professional requirements and their qualifications at university. So we are absorbing those people to actually come and assist us, just as we are doing also with the tutors. You see, some of the things that are happening right now teach us that some of the capacities we did not create in the past, whether it's in the university sector or nationally, are things we must now deal with with a sense of urgency because you do not know what is going to happen tomorrow. So all of the dithering, the doing slowly is something we must abandon because you don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow. But also, I think I take faith in what is happening among the group students themselves, the support the peer support groups that they are, they are, that they are creating using online technologies and, and the apps that we are developing at university to empower students to interact. At the end of the day, I think that peer support sometimes is much more important than actually seeing those services that become so almost clinical, almost institutionalized very heavily. And people, and also they also face some degree of stigma or their capacity and structural constraints to accessing. You expand those services by actually developing ability to be to, for people to be peers to others. I, I, I've had a chance actually since I joined the University of Pretoria, less than 18 months. Interestingly, two groups that I spent time with were raising issues of mental health with me. And, and, and they said, they asked me to speak to camera and to speak to some audio talk about how I've experienced it myself, what happened to me when I was a student. I said the distinct difference between now and then when I was a student is how much students don't often look after each other, but use social media to attack each other. And, and I think that they should change those platforms into PA forms of support. Because when I was a student, your first call of port was not going to student affairs for mental issues, was to talk to your friend and your other friends and to get that advice and actually to, to get strength. Because once you spoke with your friends, you understood you are not alone. It's not this feeling that it is affecting you. Others are there for you and so on. So we speak a lot these days about solidarity. And solidarity begins at the personal level. When you do not mock that student who seems to be in distress by sending funny messages on social media about them and others pass them on and the person feels they are out of society. You actually in essence ask them, are you okay? What can I do for you? And also you can then advise them. So I think that, that uh, a resort going back into our humanity and our ability to be, to be in solidarity with others is better than ever trying to expand institutional forms of doing so. Because it can never be enough resources to actually in a sense cancel and support every staff and every student in any enterprise or in any university. So that's, uh, that, 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 that I would answer it that, that particular way. Restoring our humanity is important to sustaining our humanity going forward. We often call it Ubuntu, but we don't actually say what we mean by it. Being there for you, you being there for me, and being there for others is what will build our, our humanity and build our institutions and repair the broken uh, things that we find in our society that lead to GB, GBV is happiness. We haven't received overwhelming reports of that. This does not mean that it's not happening. Yeah. See, what I've also noted in this, among the students is that their greatest anxiety is about the say, say real nature of the situation. 
actually people don't talk too much about the virus. They talk about this unbelievable situation that has disrupted their lives. And, and also remember that with GPV as well, is a culture of silence in our society. Mm -hmm. we go along and things become, people are freer to speak. We'll hear of the horrific things that happen in families, in the society, and in the community as well. If we have, we have seen nationally there's an increase in GPF, our students could not have been immune to that. You know, mm -hmm. they are people that they know. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, I would like to thank you for bringing us full circle to this idea of humanity, solidarity, that we really need to be holding on to our Ubuntu as people um, to really help us get through this crisis. I'd like to highlight to everybody that uh, we have shared a number of hotlines and helplines um, in the chat group uh, and uh, the web address for SADAG, www.sadag.org, which has dedicated helplines. We've also had Dr. Daniel Klimber, Klimber has been speaking about um, an organization called Healing Clouds, uh, which is uh, making available um, accessible and affordable mental health and well-being. Uh, Healing Clouds, uh, I think I looked up the website, healingclouds.com. Uh, Dr. Klimber, please will you share your email if people um can where people can get uh um can link up with you um so that uh, they can they can use your services even more and uh prof uh Kupe, uh dr bila from uh, social work and criminology at the univers at our university uh is interested in the alumni um counseling so she will be contacting you uh directly yeah. there's also an a, a yeah, that for any student at WITS, uh, the WITS student crisis line number is 0800 111 331. We will be making this recording available um, to you um, so that uh, for anyone who wants to catch up uh, on this conversation or who wants to share it with others. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to the panelists uh, for all your incredible um, input. Uh, Dr. Peed, I'd like to hand over to you. mute so i've unmuted myself thank you very much for this um wonderful panel um i want to thank professor mamukheti who had to leave us earlier you know um mamukheti is now vc at my university so it was fantastic <laughs> to have her on uh, Prof. Tawana Kupe, it was fantastic to have you also i've worked with you from vet university now at up uh, the foundation works with all the 27 universities in South Africa and other colleges, and we have uh, students from a lot of your universities. So thank you for all your wise words and wisdom. And Ms. Busi Mashiani, thank you very much for giving us input from the employees and employer's perspective. And um, Mr. Buyani Zwani, thank you also for your input on, on our leadership. What I wanted to say to our students is that, please remember that you are not alone. Um, during this crisis, you need to reach out, as uh, Professor Cooper said, to your colleagues. There's the alumni that are available to work with you. Peer uh, support is, is available as well. And to employers and employees, I want to say, do remember the, um, the, the plain adage that um, you need to put your own mask before you help those around you. And this applies to your well-being, your mental health, physical and spiritual health. So thank you everybody for making this such a successful panel discussions. And Dr. Stembile, thank you once again. And goodbye. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. P. Goodbye, everyone. Um, we've had there's the UP share, uh, care line that's been shared, 0080-747-747. Um, so please, we will also share all of these um, on all the social media platforms and the website. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>